everybody and welcome to the AJ's Technology in Practice webinar. This webinar is run in partnership with Dell Tech and I'd like to say a very big thank you to them for their support. Making sure your practice is on the front foot in terms of digital strategy and technology is more important than ever, particularly in the current context. So I'm delighted to be joined by an expert panel today who will be sharing their experiences of how digital technology can improve your practice and we'll be getting lots of hints and tips along the way. This webinar lasts for about an hour or so, so we'll have a panel discussion for around 45 minutes and then we'll be open for questions from you, our audience. Please do use the Q&A function for questions and we will try to get to as many questions as possible. So to our panel, we are joined by Jack Stewart, who's Digital Design Lead at Hawkins Brown. Jack looks at digital technology across the company to explore how it can innovate architectural practice. Jack, please could you tell us a little bit more about your role and your focus at the moment? Hey, thank you for, for having me on the webinar uh, today. Um, yeah, so we look at, I suppose, the two categories, um, kind of practice-wide initiatives. So things such as training, um, kind of broader, wider R&D um, across the practice um, and um, the kind of softer, long-term goals of, 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 kind of how we better use technology across the practice. Um, and then also um, projects. So we, um, we're kind of actively involved in um, various projects across the office um, and utilizing different technologies to um, to kind of benefit and better the delivery and the designs of those projects um, so so yeah that, that probably sums me up thank you so much and we have sue butcher who's director of communications consultancy just practicing Sue served on the UK BIM Alliance executive for two years, and she's got a specific interest in the digital transformation in the construction sphere. Sue, would you like to expand a little bit on your particular areas of expertise? Absolutely. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, great to be here today. Uh, I trained as an architect and I spent the first 15 years of my career managing architects' practices. Um, so that's sort of background. But I now, as, uh, as you said, have a digital construct, uh, consultancy that works exclusively in construction. I'm very interested in collaborative working, but, uh, but particularly the impact of digital on the construction process and in particular product data. Um, and I chaired a working group on product data for the UK BEM Alliance that wrote a report in 2018 about some of the problems. I'm now working on two fields in that area. Uh, one is a guide for housing associations on how to implement BIM, um, so a client end, and I'm also working with manufacturers uh, with various collaborators on a plain language guide to product data specifically for manufacturers. Thank you so much. And we have Rob Henderson, who's director at JDA Architects. Rob is an architect with more than 20 years experience with a focus on residential and care, care schemes at a thriving practice. Rob, do you want to tell us a little bit about your approach to digital technology in your practice? Yeah, sure. Uh, thanks for having me in the first instance. Yeah, we, we're possibly the, the, I think we mentioned it when we were sort of preparing the sort of uh, the yang to jack's ying i think you know in terms of that we're a, perhaps a medium-sized practice that is is, is delivering schemes ac across the region um, and for us the digital transformation is, is is happening all around us and we're you know perhaps you know following in the footsteps of people, of people like hawkins brown and really for us it, it lands into three sort of very definitive areas for our digital sort of areas and that's running the practice and sort of how we use digital uh, you know I was going to say we've got a team of 23 in two offices. We don't at the moment. We have a team of 23 and 23 mini offices in, you know, in the northwest and actually even Ireland at the moment. And, and so how do we collaborate as a team? Uh, we then have this sort of uh, the, the design process and the client experience and how the digital technologies can help us with that. And then finally, we need to remember that we're, you know, we're designing buildings, we're designing space. And so what digital technologies are available to help the building user at the end, the end user at the, at the end to make sure that their lives are improved by some of some of the sort of technological innovations that are happening just now. Thank you so much, Rob. 
And we also have Brett Toothhouse, who's Deltec Vice President of Product Management. Brett focuses on the changing needs of the architecture industry, and he's got a mission to identify new ways technology can solve practices, operational challenge, challenges. And prior to joining Deltec, Brett spent 15 years in architectural practice. Brett, you engage with many practices. Can you let us know a little bit about what the key things are that, that, that they need particular support with or that they ask you about? Sure. Thank you, Emily. Great to be here. I'm excited to be part of the discussion. And, you know, we're seeing obviously amplified now given the, the situation that we're all in, but, you know, we're seeing a lot of uh, chatter and talk around digital transformation and innovation. And, um, you know, a lot of our customers are, are looking for help and feedback. And, you know, if I had to distill at least what we're seeing right now down to a, a, a few key points, I think a, a couple of things that I would say is, um, you know, our customer base is is taking stock of what they currently have, you know, looking at, at what tools, what they have in place and how they might be able to further leverage those. Um, and even, you know, some of the customers that we talk to are using this um, sort of lull in, in what's going on to, um, you know, push forward some of the process or improvements or refinements they've wanted to make around their use of digital technology. So that's that's one of the key things that we're starting to see. And I think, um, you know, Rob even hit upon one of the other things we're seeing a lot about um, right now from our customers, and that is collaboration, more paperless, more connectivity through the tools that are out there. And it's not that we didn't have those in place before, or our customers didn't have those in place before, but the need is, is um, you know, far exceeded um, given the current situation. And the last thing I would say, and this may sound a little cliche, but I still think it's relevant is is the whole the whole data, um, big data, analytics, whatever you want to whatever you want to call it. Um, this is more important than ever now. Keeping a, a finger on a, on the pulse of your business and how things are going, how things are might be different with a more distributed workforce. Um, leveraging all of that data that our organizations create to to help better run and operate the business is a key thing we're seeing from our customers right now as well. Thank thank you thank you so much. Um, and great to hear a little bit more about what you do in your specific areas of expertise. So if we look at the broad picture at the moment, um, Deltex run an interesting study recently with, with Raconteur just to get a sense of how the architecture uh, sector feels uh, about digital and, and what they're doing in this area. So I just, just to pick out a few key findings to, to start with. According to the survey, more than half, that's 53% of architecture practices, say their digital strategies are at an exploratory stage. And 13% say they're just starting out in their digital transformation. And currently, no architecture firms, according to the survey, say they are digitally advanced, i.e. with a culture of digital innovation and strategic focus at executive level. So this, this area is one perhaps um, of, of challenge and possibility for architects and architecture, but, but one that perhaps they're not um, uh, perhaps exploring as fully as they might. I mean, I think it would be, it's really important to know as well that you need to stay ahead in this area, really in terms of running your practice and in the buildings that, that, that you construct. So it, it's, it's topical, it's essential. Um, so really today it's like, what, what can architects and practices do to, to to really grow what they're doing and build on what they're doing in this area. So I think to kick off really, if, 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 if I could start with you, Jack, it would be great if you could just give a sense of your, your take on the sector and what digital technology is currently being used in practice and how. Um, yeah, so to pick up um, on what, what Brett was just uh, talking about in terms of data, I think a lot of uh, emerging sort of technologies in, in, in the construction industry and in architectural practice um, at the moment are kind of leveraging the increasing amounts of built environment, design and construction data that's becoming um, more accessible um, and there is a growing amount of it. Um, and so some of the, the, the technologies and some of the things that we've been developing around that kind of automation tools which become possible as we are delivering and designing buildings within um, kind of digital environments within um, BIM software for instance um, so we're developing uh, programs macros and scripts to help kind of automate um, and speed up processes um, there's also kind of tools to better communicate designs to clients and to other stakeholders um, so developing 
a virtual reality environments and using gaming engines to start to develop sort of 4D um, interactive um, spaces. Um, there's generative design tools, so um, using uh, using kind of programming and scripting to help to explore perhaps um, complex geometries or um, to um, there's, there's, there are a few examples of feasibility design kind of software where they've taken a specific service um, and sort of created a product around it. And there are a few sort of startups that are that are, that are looking to push these kind of products. Um, and then I think um, also uh, technologies that enable us to better work with contractors, better work with the build process. So how do we, once we've got this design data, how do we better hand that over to a contractor, which will be, they will be increasingly using machines to fabricate and assemble buildings. Um, and I'd say those are some, some really sort of key areas. And then there's, there's also the kind of in-use technologies um, for buildings, so sensors and um, kind of applications and building management systems that are, that are also using that data. The one thing that they all have in common is there's this kind of thread of data that is kind of uh, being passed on and leveraged at every single stage of the process. Um, yeah. Thank you so much. So really a full, a full range of, of technologies there. In terms of how, how practices might embrace this um, and what will happen if they don't, um, Brett, I wonder if I could come to you. It's like, you know, what, 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 what is your take on how practices should really be in embracing digital technology and, and the perils of not doing that? Well, I think the first thing to mention is, you know, you look at even the statistics from, from the survey that, that you cited earlier. And I think one of the first things that, that, that firms need to understand is digital transformation. The word itself is daunting. Um, you know, the concept of transformation, I think, is somewhat intimidating to many companies. And I think companies need to understand that while they may not um, have a discrete project that's called digital transformation within their organizations, that doesn't mean they're not digitally transforming. That doesn't mean they're not leveraging what's going on with technology to help their businesses, because I would bet that many, many firms are but they don't necessarily call it digital transformation. And I think recognizing that is important because it takes a little bit of the stigma and the in, uh, intimidation of this digital transformation concept off the table. So I think one of the first things that people need to understand is I'm, I'm, I'm probably already doing some of this in maybe small ways here and there, and I just need to continue to build on that. So in terms of the how, I think that's one of the first steps customers need to take. Um, and then I would say, you know, what happens if you don't? Um, you know, I think the, the, the climate we're in today is probably a great example of that. It, it, it's time when we have to pivot a little bit. It's time when we have to adapt. It's time when we have to, you know, maybe look at some different business models um, to help us take us forward, get through the current situation and, and hopefully come out on the other end thriving. Um, that's amplified now more than ever. And I think if, if, if firms, companies don't start to look at how they can leverage the digital age to help their business and respond to the current situation and come out on the other end in a positive way, you know, they, they may not come out uh, uh, in a good way on the other end of this and may not be able to adapt in the time that they need to. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. In, in terms of the most important thing then practices can do to excel, accelerate that digital, um, digital drive, Sue, do you, do you, would you like to speak to that point? From your experience, what, what, what's, what, what can practices be doing now to really push this forward? I think there are, there are two things. One is the, the, the current crisis, as Brett mentioned, and the other is getting back to basics. Um, so I'll, I'll talk about the basics first. And, you know, um, the term is not only daunting because it's trendy and, uh, and, uh, and therefore people don't think about it as a, uh, as a real thing. Let's talk about some real examples. So let's talk about your digital footprint. Okay, what does your digital footprint look like online? Um, in the current climate, it's going to be very difficult for people to tell whether your business is still operating. They can't actually contact you in the way they used to perhaps. Um, and if you're not posting, of course, that's a problem. But when did you last Google yourself or your key staff? Can you can you um, can people find your client-facing staff and talk to them on LinkedIn? Um, 
And, uh, and of course, do your employees know how to use social media safely and sensibly? Because we're not just talking about private groups here. We're also talking about webinars they're attending and we're talking about their personal social platforms and what they're saying on those platforms. You know, there's an HR issue there, but also there's a marketing issue. So, you know, does your website generate unique inquiries? I know it's, you know, very boring, but how does it rank for searches on the sort of things that your clients are concerned about now? What are are those things that they're concerned about this is all digital content um, and and we are all moving in that space now um, so uh, so I think starting from the basics is a very good beginning thank you so much uh, Rob in in terms of your experience uh, running and, and working in a medium sized practice um, which will have its own challenges and, and opportunities what 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 are you doing? Where do you where do you see um, the opportunity to to accelerate and grow what you're doing digitally? Yes, yeah, so I, I completely agree with Brett in terms of some of the language that's being used in in, in this whole arena. You know, digital transformations is it a formal digital strategy? What does that mean? You, you know and and I'll, I'll be quite honest i have no idea you know but but when we've when we've moved through you know, as best as we're doing a lot of this that you know the, the project information management that we have that central store of you know emails real life financial information is absolutely key to us you know how much time are people spending on that when when people are working radially when people are not no longer in that office space you know, how, how do you manage that you know so so having those structures in place i think has been pretty fundamental for us certainly over you know over the last three months or so the other big one i'd say is that you know as we've mentioned the tools are still let teams has been with us for i don't know three years I'm, I'm guessing and we've never used it you know we've moaned quite a lot about collaboration and, and talking between the teams and the two offices and all of a sudden, this, this whole crisis has, has forced us to prove that some of these existing uh, you know, tools and innovations can work for us. We've actually proved we're more efficient. We've proved that you know, we can talk to one another without being in the same room. Um, and we've, even to the extent of you know, approving drawings, how do you do that when you've got 23 people in, in 23 different homes you know, and making sure that that quality is retained? So, a lot of the tools that we've started to use, the collaboration tools, have been very much structured around this. Um, and, and, you know, I think Revit, BIM, uh, is pretty well embedded, um, you, you know, for, for a lot of practices, you know, and that, that moving through to, to, to virtual reality, I think will, will be a big step for us. You know, we, we, pure example for us, we, we had a fairly inexperienced client who, who just simply can't read a drawing. You know, they, you put a two-dimensional piece of paper in front of him, it, it means very, very little. Being able to pop him into, uh, you know, again, another buzzword, an immersive reality, whatever you want to call it, you know, into that virtual reality model, he could feel it. He, he knew what was coming when he walked around the building when it was built. He said, yes, I've seen this before. And I think that those sorts of structures and those sorts of um, tools that, that talk to one another, uh, will, will, will help us move forward, you know, even as a medium sized practice. And as I you know, go back to the point, we, we might base, you know, some of our learnings on, on, on some innovation that Jack's producing at the moment, right at that, that sort of cutting edge. And then it would drip down into perhaps, you know, into more of the mainstream practices like ourselves. Do you think there's an opportunity there, Rob, for um, to, to help you win more work? I mean, did you feel that when you've had these discussions with clients, that it's actually helped um helped you not only explain what you're doing but 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 perhaps win new clients win new work yeah i think it will because you know you you can start to um use those examples you know it became a much more efficient design process you know as, as well which is an interesting thing you know we're, we're not making changes because he doesn't understand and so we can start to build those sorts of experiences into our presentations to new clients you know um, it, it, it will enormously help 
it's not so long ago we were on you know 2d card and and, and yellow folders you, you know all of those sorts of things so those efficiencies and that reputational sort of uh, element for us being able to present ourselves as a, uh, a digitally forward thinking practice is you, you know is key and you know we i'll have somebody will be online somewhere looking at me probably laughing his hipster beard off you know with me talking about digital transformations who's our bim champion um you, you know Stu. So, but it's not about that it's about the culture it, it, it's about outcome i think and, and and setting the right culture and then using tools to support the outcome i think is really important and i think that helps you win more work and and do it better Thank you so much. I, I'm, I'm, I'm hearing a, a few of you have mentioned collaboration, which, which seems, seems really important. Um, you know, in terms, of, in terms of the recent research that Dell Tech did actually um, with Raconteur, architecture practices identified poor cross-functional collaboration as being the biggest barrier to success. So this is a, this is a theme that's, that's coming across. How, how can practices collaborate better? How can they um, learn more from that? And perhaps who should they be collaborating with? Um, Jack, I wonder if you could speak to that. So the, I suppose the, the industry, the construction industry is naturally quite a fragmented industry with lots of individual players um, and the process to you know, go from um, an idea, uh, sort of inception of, of a um, of an idea, and then procuring a building um, is a long process. And for some projects, you know, that's that's many number of years. Um, and there are many uh, different organisations involved in that. Um, and I suppose that as as a result, that kind of fragmented industry has been a bit of a um, a bit of a blocker. Um, and um, collaboration and better exchanging information and sort of sharing between um, organizations um, is, is something that could be vastly improved. I think through projects, when everybody's kind of around the same goal, um, that's the best opportunity to do that. We found our kind of richest collaborations with, with other um, organizations have been when um, we've been kind of around a common goal, which would typically be the delivery of a project. Um, the Kiri's Gantry project, for instance, um, was a really good example of that working alongside wiki house um and I, I think that there are whilst that's a blocker there is also a slight advantage to having a fragmented industry um the reason being is that digital transformation um, or um disruption um is less likely to result in kind of the industry being ubered <laughs> so uh, one organization Sort of stepping in and hoovering up the, the whole industry. Um, we may see that there are certain subsets of, and of our services that we offer that get kind of packaged up, turned into products and resold at scale, um, which is kind of what organizations like, like Uber have done for you know, private hire taxis. Um, but it's, it's a bit harder to do that with such a complex fragmented industry. So there's an opportunity for all players to kind of, as long as we're speaking the same language, um, to, 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 to try to innovate our parts and hand over to the kind of next um, part of the process or inherit from the, from the you know, part of the process previously um, in the procurement of a building um, in better ways. And, and I think that, um, yeah, the, the, there is a benefit to, to, um, to that kind of fragmented nature. It, it means that, that we, as long as we all are kind of innovating and speaking the same language, we can, we can hopefully all benefit from, from you know, uh, digital disruption and transformation. Uh, so I think that's a, you know, a, a potential positive there as well. Thank you so much. And, and Sue, I, I, know, I, I know collaboration is, is, is a point that really, really interests you. In, in terms of your construction uh, background and knowledge, what, what, does, what does best practice look like from your point of view in terms of practices collaborating to really drive their digital uh, strategy and approach forward? I think um, the most important thing that you can do 
is seek out those organisations and people who have been working on the topic of collaborative working for years and haven't had any attention or uh, enough attention given to them. Some of them are new initiatives as well. So, for example, Constructing Excellence has been promoting collaborative working for donkey's years, has written a lot of new articles about it recently, um, and they have regional groups. And, and a lot of them, I know the London branch, is running their events virtually now. Of course, they probably all are. So it's an opportunity to network with people across the industry about collaborative working. There's a, um, a Behaviours for Collaboration community, um, because behaviour is the main um, key element of collaborative working. The technology can enable, that's about 10%. The legal structures in construction prevent collaborative working. Um, and people are working on that. That's probably about 20%. The rest is all about our behaviour and about learning to listen to people in other disciplines as well as in our own um, and learning from each other. Um, and being willing to share our knowledge and expertise and learn from each other's. Um, and the other, the other project that people might be interested to know about, which is an infrastructure based because it's uh, run by the ICE, is called Project 13. And that's a really enormous project designed to help elaborate and uh, the whole concept of changing the construction industry into a more collaborative working model. Now I'm, I'm, I'm posting a few links on Twitter, so I'll, uh, I'll add links to these other groups on there for you. Thank you so much. So in terms of that co real collaboration, um, Brett, I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about that as well. I, I found this a really interesting part of the survey to, to see that it's, it's considered very important. Our practices recognise that and yet perhaps they're not, not doing it as much as they should. What, would you like to speak to that? Yeah, I think one of the interesting things that, that we've found, especially in, in recent months, is, you know, there's really two types of collaboration. A lot of what we've talked about so far was collaboration across a broader project team, not necessarily just within an organization. And one of the things that, that we're finding is um, our customer base is coming to us looking at how they can use their tools to collaborate and even internally. Just, you know, a, a great example. Um, uh, cultivating a pipeline within an organization and pursuing business, uh, you know, that's a, that's a collaborative process within an organization to make sure that you're talking to the right people and keeping up with people and, um, you know, following up on activities around what might need to be done to cultivate that relationship. And that, that's an aspect that, that our customer base is coming to us and saying, hey, we have tools here, help us use them to, to, to manage and cultivate the pipeline to make sure we're keeping the, the engine running hot as, as we work through this current, these current times. So the, the one thing I would say um, in regards to the, the collaboration topic is yes, across the broader project teams, absolutely important. And there's um, ways and means that, that we can be better at that, but even within our own walls and, you know, Rob sort of identified this as well when he talked about the 23 different offices that he has, um, you know, using those tools to help facilitate those internal conversations um, and, and, and do things that, that might have been done face to face now inside some of the digital technology that's out there, um, I think is a key step forward as well. And the other thing too is, you know, we talk about the current climate and things that we've had to do and pivot as a result of it, but the, the great thing about this is I think it can instill some habits and some disciplines, you know, when we come out of this that will make us better as well because using the tools that we have to collaborate captures a lot of the information and things that we do and we can leverage that down the road um, to help us be better, to help us learn what we can do differently the next time around. Um, so it's not just about the current climate, it's also about sort of um, muscle memory and habit forming to, to make us better long term as well. Thank you so much Brett. Do, do, you, do you want to talk a little bit more about how you see digital technology in terms of what practices might use or opportunities for practices um, in terms of the landscape post-COVID? I mean, have you, this is such an extraordinary time, you know, we are all working remotely. Are there any sort of key trends that, that you see that you want to elaborate a little bit upon that the practices need to be aware of? Yeah, I think, I think um, Jack started to hit on one of them, and this is a little bit of a buzzword, but it's also something that we're seeing take hold um, within the business of our customers in a lot of different ways. And that's really about automation. You know, some people call this RPA or robot, robotic process automation. Um, even self-services sort of fit into this, but this is a trend that's definitely gaining some traction um, because there's, you know, let's face it, there's a lot of things within our organizations that 
human hands have to do and execute and things like that, that, that we could start to automate, that we could start to leverage bots and um, things like that to help process and, and make better, make more efficient, and, and perhaps have humans focus on more value-added things that, that only humans can do. So that, that's definitely a trend that we're seeing. And it's, it's interesting because it's certainly been a little bit amplified under the current environment as well because of the constraints that's being put on the workforce as a result of us being more distributed um, and things like that. You know, just to give you an example, one of the, the areas we're seeing a lot of this is in sort of back office um, bank reconciliation, uh, processing invoices, recognizing invoices, and, and all of the approval process around those um, using, again, machines, bots, whatever you want to call it to help automate and facilitate that process is something we're starting to see gain a lot of traction. And I think you're going to see that automation. You know, Jack made some examples of that as well um, on the design deliverable side of things. But I think you're going to start to see really um, the automation take hold and, 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 and um, fill the needs again so that, that humans within the organizations can focus on more value added items. So that's one of them. And then I think the second one that I would that I would highlight and I sort of hit on this before is um, the idea of data. Uh, you know, big data, analytics, artificial intelligence, all of those things are, are key buzzwords that are out there. And they can be a little bit daunting at times, especially when you start talking about things like artificial intelligence. But these technologies and, and the stuff around data and processing data is becoming more accessible every day. Um, and I think there's going to be little ways that, that organizations are going to start to find they can use machine learning, they can use artificial intelligence to better their um, you know, their business is one of the things that we're looking at right now inside of Deltec is how we can help organizations harness the massive amount of information that they collect as they execute a project to help predict project success on future projects. Um, it, it sounds like a sort of a complicated thing, but the reality is, is like I said, the businesses in this industry have the data to support this type of functionality. We're trying to figure out how we can help help customers leverage that. So I think keeping an eye on where things are going with things like artificial and, and intelligence and machine learning um, is another key thing coming out of this um, this situation that, that organizations should be focused on. Thank you so much, Brett. Uh, you mentioned AI. Uh, so, so I think that that leads on really to, to another, another uh, question area and a finding from the survey. So According to the, 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 the Dell Tech survey, 44% of architecture practices indicate that AI is very important. Interestingly, 72% of engineering firms identified it as a top technology trend. So I think it would be really, be really uh, interesting to find what you make of this finding, this, this disconnect between the fact that architects put it as important, but not as important as engineers uh, do. Um, and also perhaps just to explore a little bit what, what AI means for practices. Um, Jack, if I, could, if I could come to you on that, what technology is currently being used in terms of artificial intelligence? Yeah, so, well, to, to the question to do with kind of the difference between engineers and, and architects, um, see value of that technology um, is interesting. And I think it possibly comes down to the, the difference between kind of objective and subjective tasks in, in each of those two disciplines. Um, architecture tends to, we tend to have um, more subjective kind of um, solutions where it's not completely straightforward or, or, or um, you can't numerically or quantitatively decide what the right solution is. Um, and those kind of problems are much harder for a machine to resolve um, where a human can kind of make that judgment um, when the answer is not necessarily like a kind of mathematical um, conclusion. So I think that that's possibly why there is a difference there where engineers can perhaps see the direct application of, of, of a machine kind of giving the correct um, output um, based on a number of kind of parameters and analysis, whereas architects possibly um, would find it harder to understand how you know a machine could come to that conclusion. But I think um, what we what we are seeing and what we've kind of seen um, since the beginning of kind of time really is that the um, designers or uh, humans have worked uh, with machines or developed their own machines to help them to realize their ideas. And, um, you know, whether this is like in the early, you know, the, the early 1900s when the, the um, first drawing board was, was developed, that was at its time, you know, technology. Um, and, 
we we you know we had access to 3D modeling in the, in the 80s, but yet we were only really modeling buildings in in 3D in the kind of uh, you know as we got into the you know 2000s 2010s. Um, and so I think that architects and designers have always been working alongside machines to help to uh, realize their ideas. We 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 did a great study trip a couple of years ago. We went to um, ARS Electronica in Linz, um, and there was um, artists who were developing um, or creating their artworks whilst using various um, new technologies. So an artist that was kind of controlling um, seven axis robotic arm to kind of um, paint on a wall. And there was another artist that had cloned their own, their own blood and was, and they were, they were doing a live um, performance on a piano kind of with themselves. It was very, very bizarre, but I think um, we're seeing maybe more sophisticated means by which designers can work um, with more intelligent machines. Um, and, Kind of as Brett was alluding to earlier, like there are some actually like less sophisticated things that we can do in practice already um, that are quite accessible, automating and streamlining um, processes um, that are kind of a more of a kind of binary um, calculatable outcome. Um, and then perhaps for the more subjective uh, design tasks or the more subjective things in practice, um, there needs to be more thought in how. Um, designers can work alongside these machines and there can be kind of a two-way dialogue um, to come to the correct kind of conclusion and correct solution. So I think it's got a, I think AI sounds like real scary because it's, uh, it, it, it kind of sounds like, I, I don't really understand how that works, um, but actually at the most simplified level, it's, it's just automating tasks, it's macros, it's using Excel, um, and then that can become more and more sophisticated. Um, so yeah, I, I yeah, that I, I hopefully that kind of answers that. Thank you so much. It was really really good insight there. Thank you. In in terms of um, AI, Rob, is that something that it does it does does that does that um, the the buzzword uh, present a challenge to you, or do you is is AI something that that you 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 would like to be doing a little bit more of? I mean, I know you've touched on this earlier, but is, is yeah, that a topic that, that you listen, want, to, want to be exploring? We, we, we've not cloned any blood recently, but, you, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll perhaps look into it um, <laughs> in the next couple of months, you know. But to, to, to be honest with you, again, the term, you know, artificial intelligence, what does it mean? How does it work? But ultimately, we need to bring this back to the, to the people that are using the spaces you know, and, and then the people that are using the buildings that we're doing and how, how these new tools can, can help people you know ultimately that that's very often what we do yes we're building with fabric but you know we're putting people in these homes and in these care environments or in these offices and and how that works in a post-covid environment is is going to be a really interesting exercise you know from our point of view a lot of those issues you know will come back to sustainability um of course which i think is going to be a much greater we lost the, the green agenda you know post 2008 i think and Perhaps a lot of these tools will be helping us bring that, that sustainable agenda back back into line. But um, I, if I can go on to the people again and the assistive technologies as, as, as we know them, um, you know, in that care environment, you know, are, are helping people live more independent lives. You know, if I can take it perhaps to a dementia, a, a, an area, those senses that people have in their homes that people are wearing uh, those fall detection um, sensors that that their people are starting to use you know digital transformation in artificial intelligence is, is, is usually happening you know on on, on the phone um, and so those apps that are available to us now to remind people to take their meds in a dementia environment are starting to come to the fore and you know I think it's it is very important you know Jack's mentioned you know the, the drawing boards that, that were absolute technology at, at, at a given time it was a tool it was a tool to design and it was a tool to build what we're looking at now is just a new set of tools to be able to build and help people perhaps you know in, in their own lives and you know the end users of, of, of this so I think for me we need to focus perhaps not not on, on, on the artificial intelligence itself, but what's the outcome 
of, of that and how can we use that to improve both the built environment and people's lives, I think. And you put that very eloquently about putting the people at the heart of it. So and I, I think we've, we've talked previously, haven't we, about um, another, another sort of buzzword, the Internet of Things. But basically the idea of in, intelligent buildings. Yeah. You know, it's like if we unpick what that means, Internet of Things, but, you know, what does it actually mean in terms of your design and for, your, for the end users? And it might be as simple as those sensors you're talking about or being able to really measure measure uh, how energy is used in the building so it really speaks to the green agenda sustainability issues i, I think so emily it, it, you know it needs to move beyond um telling alexa to turn the lights on you, yeah. you, you know which it fundamentally is is, is yeah is a new technology for us you know um and and being able to to have digitally enabled homes or or, or environments mm. that yes monitor you know the uh, how much energy is being used, but allowing people to um, come in and, and, and fix those systems, you know, so to, to, to maintenance, to, to increase efficiency ar around that home, whilst also allowing somebody to, you know, uh, an elderly dementia uh, resident to talk to their talk to their folks, talk to their kids, because they've had a reminder on their, you know, digitally enabled uh, computer that you, you should call, if you, you know, and that's, so, so that's important. And I think it, it's about um, bringing everything together, you know, in, in, in the prep, Jackson, we just need to be more aware. We need to be involved in actually what's seen as a mechanical and electrical function. And we perhaps should be, as architects, more involved in, in how those technologies are applied to the, the built environment that we're, that, we're, that we're delivering ultimately. So is it about having more agency here, architects, Sort of owning this a bit more do you think sue is i mean you've you've, you've talked about this you know perhaps the, the ability to track products all the way through this this um to, the you know the golden thread that that's that's, that that's been highlighted by the by the hacker review but you know the, the idea of being able to really track and trace all the way through this idea of using data efficiently so you really understand uh, how and how your building works and why and 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 what it does is that something you'd like to talk about the... wouldn't that be marvelous <laughs> <laughs> um it's uh it's a it's an ongoing challenge i mean one, one of the things that i know um continues to frustrate architects is the um the difficulty they find in being able to compare products and to choose products uh, based on their performance uh, on characteristics that aren't qualitative they're, they're very basic characteristics and yet it's extremely difficult to do that and um, and and really important um, and I think it's uh, Rob is actually absolutely right you know the more designers are um, involved in the experiences of users the better because we might actually get that feedback loop that we've been talking about that performance um, uh, review uh, process uh, that's you know now embedded in the plan of work and part of the problem I think is that the um, our industry as a whole isn't digitized that way it doesn't structure its information in that way so products information is in PDF format you know and everyone's website has a different way of presenting it um, and and part of the reason for that of course is that the commercial impact uh, interests of different companies inhibit and hamper their sharing of digital information it makes them not want to do that but i think architects are in a in a good position where um if you can look out information like that if you can tell the um the distributors of information if you like the people who are hosting it where you use it now what you want from their platforms um because you know the vast majority of architects go direct to manufacturers platforms well why is that um because they believe that's the place where the most relevant up-to-date information is available even if it's not available in a comparable form so i think it's, it's really important that we should be starting to ask our suppliers because when we specify products we are um, we're giving an awful lot of money to people so absolutely we have a right to say we we want to know about this product and of course we also want to know what's actually installed 
um, and uh, uh, and uh, how it performs afterwards. And that's really what um, Judith Hackett has been talking about. That's the reason why Grenfell didn't work. And I think architects have a very important role in that thread to, um, to start speaking up for it. Absolutely. Thank you so much. In, in terms of how, how designs might change, just in terms of what our buildings might might feel like and look like, Jack. I don't know if you want to uh, talk a little around that. Did you? Do, is are we going to? Do you? Will you see great change in in what buildings are like, or is it? Is this incremental um, in terms of people's experiences of buildings? Uh, a drive for for greater. Uh, digital technology within how we design um, I think, I, yeah i don't foresee that we'll see um kind of immediate um drastic changes in the way that, that our buildings kind of operate and um and and look um i suppose like using digital there was maybe a time where like parametric architecture or digital design processes were quite kind of visually put a Zaha Hadid building and you kind of think, okay, that's digital technology because um, there have been parametric processes and quite advanced methods of taking a design and fabricating it to create the forms. Um, but the, the WikiHouse, um, the project that we did with WikiHouse on the gantry at Here East, the forms actually, they're, they're quite, um, what's the word, like modest, they, they, don't, they don't scream parametrics, but if you get under the the hood of how it's all assembled like it's crazy parametric generative design um, that's been used to kind of automate the, the, the construction of those um those buildings so i think um i've been talking probably a lot about process and how we how we design um because that i guess is like my natural background coming from working as an architect uh, to bring projects uh, to, to what i do now um, but I think in, in, it's really important that kind of Rob has highlighted that, you know, the way that buildings are used um, and um, we, we're designing buildings for, for our clients and we're designing buildings for the, for the people that occupy them and use them. And that's really, really important. And um, we shouldn't take our kind of eye off the, the goal that is to, to create kind of the best um, places that we can. Um, and I think um, we will start to see uh, technology being in coming in embedded into um, into buildings and there's an interesting kind of study on the kind of hardware of buildings and the software of buildings and should architects be involved in the kind of software development process and, and I do think that the experience of, of future buildings will be somebody will have to design those kind of um, the digital experiences so if a building is responding to users and we see a lot of this with um, kind of sustainability and um, reg, you know, kind of regulating internal environments and people being able to have control over like active or passive um, environmental controls. Um, these kind of things are important for architects to have a, a, a knowledge of, to know that, you know, if a user wants to configure or change their space in a certain way, um, then the, the user will um, kind of engage with the building and do X and that will result in Y happening. Um, and I think that, that the, yeah, where we maybe um, previously were focusing on kind of physical um, hardware of buildings, um, we, we're now perhaps it's it's interesting for architects to be involved in the in the kind of the software of buildings and how um, how they can kind of respond to users um, digitally. Um, thank you, thank you so much, Jack. Um, Brett, are there any things you'd like to talk just to, I'm think conscious we're of time and probably we need to move on to questions from, from the audience shortly, but are there any key blockers that you think that architects have um, in terms of digital technology? Are there any, are there any key things that, that keep coming back to you when you speak with practices that if perhaps practices could overcome, that it would really help their business? I think we uh, there's definitely blockers out there. I think we've hit upon a couple of them already. I think the the dauntingness um, of of digital transformation in and of itself is is probably one of the most common blockers out there. You know, we often hear from from our customer base, I don't know where to start. You know, where do I start? How do I start? That is probably one of the biggest blockers. And I would sort of 
a, a, a related blocker to that is, and, and again, something that's amplified in the current climate is the, the costs involved and investments that might be need to be made to leverage some of the digital technologies that are out there. So I think I think those two together are are probably significant blockers that we see. And and quite frankly, you know, I know there's a lot of talk between large organizations, medium organizations, small organizations, we see that pretty commonly across, you know, the full range of, of size of organizations. And one of the biggest things that, that we recommend and, and we see success around um, within organizations is looking at what you already have. And we sort of, we sort of started to talk about this earlier, but so many organizations already have investments that, that they have in place. Um, and, and looking at how you can further leverage those investments. And j just to give you a, an example, one of the things that, that we're seeing, actually two things that we're seeing pretty commonly right now. The first one is, you know, there are tools out there to help you plan your projects better and predict projects better and things like that. And for better or worse, it's, it's typically part of the system that is used the less for, for different reasons within organizations. And we're seeing organizations, because of the, the situation that they're in right now, looking at these parts of their system, their system now and saying, you know what, maybe we need to get better, more disciplined, um, deeper adoption around these areas of our, um, of our systems to make us a better organization. So um, it's not an additional investment from new software, new technology, new hardware, whatever the case may be. It's something they already have in place that they just need to get um, get better at using and, and the other the other thing that we're seeing which is sort of interesting um, and again sort of relates to you don't need to necessarily do further investments but we're seeing a lot of our organizations take this time to do upgrades that they've been putting off because they've been busy because other things have been going on um, you know they see a little bit of a lull uh, they want to keep people busy etc cetera, etc cetera you know, let's let's make sure we're on the latest and greatest so that when we do take stock of what we have and how we can leverage those investments, we're we're looking at the, like I said, the latest and greatest um, in, in terms of the pieces that we have in place. So I think that's the key blocker and, and some techniques that we're seeing organizations use to to overcome. Thank you so much. So I think we can move to some questions now from from the audience. We've got a good one here from an architecture student. So they're saying that they find universities struggle to teach and promote technology as something critical to the profession. They teach hand drawing techniques, um, they highlight the importance of crafting handmade models. Um, so I think this person's got a feeling that, you know, as a student coming to working in practice, they have little knowledge uh, or skills given in relation to technology. Do, do you feel that uh, this is something that universities need to address. Is this something that needs to be to be taught more? The potential of digital technology. I'll throw that yeah. open. <laughs> yeah, I'd, I'd, be yeah. I'd be happy to answer that. Sorry, yeah, I, it. <laughs> I disappeared. Just I am. Um, I'm not sure how far you you kind of heard on the previous previous answer. Yeah, we heard lots of it. It was excellent. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> what are the chances, man, of a power cut? I haven't had, we haven't had it <laughs> before. Um, crazy. Um, yeah, on the university, um, I saw that question pop up and it's a really interesting one. I think it's a super valid question. Um, we kind of get involved in the in, in advising and, and um, kind of working with our, our HR team um, around, uh, you know, what kind of skills should we be bringing into the practice? There's a great opportunity for kind of new recruits to bring uh, skills into the practice that perhaps practices don't already have. Um, and um, I think there was also a question um, around kind of smaller practices um, and how, uh, you know, a practice of two to five people may struggle to, to allocate um, the resources to have somebody kind of focusing on this. And I think, you know, part two um, architects or architect, uh, architects out of, from university that have been exploring um, digital design are potentially a great fit for that. Um, but to go back to the original question, um, I, I do believe that the kind of, the the thrust of university teaching um, and some institutions possibly focus on this more than others um, around kind of producing um, the like great looking buildings um, and perhaps maybe not focusing as much on the functionality of them. But, um, uh, it can maybe steer um, architects down a kind of route of great image making, um, but maybe um, not kind of thinking about how you can evolve and change the process. Um, however, what I would say is that like 
1% of Hawkins Brown, we were nearly 300 staff and there are three of us in our digital design team, kind of are highly specialized in computation and coding and programming because it's a lot to kind of develop and learn those skills. I mean, the architectural education is already a pretty long process. Um, and so there is a lot to, to learn. I, I think that what is very useful is for the remaining kind of 97% um, of the practice to be to be kind of empowered um, and knowledgeable about how technology could be used to better impact their projects. They don't necessarily have to be able to code and program, um, but to have an idea of where um, they could apply some of these techniques, then they can come to a team like ours and, 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 and kind of ask the question and we can support them in, in building um, technologies and tools. So I think that it's, I think it's a fair comment. I believe that universities um, can improve um, on their teaching of new and emerging technology. Um, although it's a pretty fast paced, changing, um, changing area. Um, and some of the greatest kind of innovations in the industry have come from uh, university initiatives. I mean, the WikiHow project, I know I've mentioned it a few times, but that started life as a, as a kind of university student project from Sheffield Uni. Um, and we are liaising with a, a course at Sheffield University, um, Digital Architecture and Design a Master's course, um, which focuses on um, a lot of the things that we are um, that we are developing uh, within our digital design team at Hawkins Brown. So that's kind of a, a quite a specialized course. I think for most architects and the majority of architects in our practice, um, we are developing and uh, designing and delivering buildings for clients. And therefore the key um, skills uh, around being able to do that are still incredibly important. And, and most university courses will be We'll be teaching that um, and kind of the critical analysis of design creative thinking the creative thought process is transferable whether you're using coding to kind of do that or whether you're um, drawing kind of with your you know with your, with your model making or drawing with your hands so I, I think um, if you're interested in it as a student then, um, then 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 go for it and explore it I think that's the best thing that, that you can do um, and some universities perhaps are Kind of embracing and, and starting to teach some of these digital processes more than others um, it should definitely be a subset of the curriculum i believe um, but perhaps ju not just yet should all students be thinking okay we all need to know how to code and program thank you so much jack there's a question directed uh specifically at you sue that i've got here oh hang on it's just jumped down where is it oh yeah so Sue, you, you've mentioned issues around social media usage, including staff's personal prof profiles and usage of them during sort of personal time. Um, have, you got, have you got any examples of best practice of how employees can use social media uh, mm -hmm. to support their practice? And perhaps any examples of pitfalls? What should they not be doing? <laughs> Okay, the, the first thing, very interesting question, yeah. Um, the first thing, first thing to say is that people's personal profiles belong to them. Yeah. And this is a bit of a challenge for employers because of course they're used to controlling the message and they can't anymore um, because, um, because their employees can broadcast media and perhaps even more effectively than they can through a corporate account as well. Um, but of course employees have a responsibility to comply with their contract of employment so they don't want to do anything that brings the practice into disrepute um, and uh, this is not a new phenomenon you know it's a 10 year old phenomenon but obviously our attitude to it is gradually changing over time um, so uh, for example about five years ago I was working with a very large London architects practice and we were teaching them how to blog and we also did some Twitter training um, uh, in order to help them promote their blog posts that they were writing as thought leaders so they were key particularly selected individuals um, but as part of that I did an audit of everyone who said they worked for them and discovered that they had an employee who was who had a personal account that was attached to their grinder profile and which I wouldn't have known that they worked for this person except that they were tweeting check-ins at the office and talking to one of the employees I personally knew um, now there's nothing wrong with having a grinder profile um, but the thing about this person is that they didn't realize that they were attaching their private life to their work life and it's very difficult to keep them separate so what we did um, I 
privately, quietly mentioned this to the person I was working with in the firm, and we developed a, an education program for their entire staff, which was over 200 people, uh, which was a sort of half hour CPD session that everyone did at lunchtime over a, a several months. Um, which we did to help their staff just think about being safe and sensible online. Um, and of course, it's not all bad news because uh, people have been searching for people they may recruit via uh, Google and finding people's LinkedIn profiles and thinking about the people that they know, their little black book, which is now quite often visible online and employing people on the basis of that background for years. Um, and the same as, you know, one's audience online in other ways. Um, so I think that having a, having a good social media presence is a good thing for an employee, but it is always important for people to think about the personal uh, versus professional profile. Thank you so much. So it's about being aware and it be and using the technology appropriately. Mm -hmm. I think we've got I think we've got um, time for one one more question. Um, this is a good one. If you could if you could introduce one thing um, to architectural education in terms of the development of digital technologies or digital approaches. What would it be? I think that's a great ending question. What's the one thing that uh, students, uh, young architects coming into the practice profession need to know? Why don't Why don't we go go round go round the um, go round the panel? Rob, to you. The one oh, thing you'd like. That, thanks for that, Emily. Yeah, I was going to say Jack first, but you know. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. <Just laughs> I. I think it's just it, it's the it's the understanding that these technologies are a tool now. So we're going to be using Revit and and and, and BIM for for the long term. So people coming into our organisation need to be able to push that forward, you know. And so so having the hand drawings, just as the the question was previously, you know, having the hand drawings and that fundamental elements of design is is absolutely key. And I completely agree. You know, with hand drawings or whatever it happens to be, but. They also need to come out with that with that new toolkit that that can push the organisation along with them, I think you know, and sort of coming into a culture and moving that forward. So I, I think it's just that understanding of how they can use their technologies. They're going to be far more adept at using some of these technologies, as Jack has just said, than you know a middle-aged bloke who still colours in for a living. You know, it's so so it, with the culture and, and and their new knowledge i think we, we, we can actually progress together and i think that's the really important side of things to come out thank you so much brett if i could if i can move to you the what the one the one thing that a, a, a newly qualified architect needs to needs to know in terms of digital technology uh, i think my 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 push would be the use of technology for more integrated teams and i mean across the entire project um, you know the concept of integrated project delivery uh, and all of those sort of things that are that are running around the industry um, technology can support that technology can help that and I think if universities and, and the education system for not only architects but engineers and, and contractors alike start to, to push those things I think it, it, it's better for the business the industry long term as well thank you and Sue I would say uh, I would say the confidence to go out of your discipline um, and uh, and find people who are interested in the topics you're interested in. Um, you know, if you think about the BIM as an example, it began with lots of different individuals in different businesses and they found each other online having these conversations. And it wasn't until much later on that the businesses started to pay attention. Um, so, uh, so don't feel yourself as siloed in a profession. Go looking for people elsewhere in the industry who are interested in what you're interested in because you all have your education to share with them as well and everyone has something to bring to that conversation. And of course now it's so much easier for people to do that online. Um, and I used to say that uh, Twitter it wasn't just about a cat can look at a king, a cat can now talk to a king. So go and find out who's interesting, find out where they are online and start asking them questions. Thank you so much. And Jack, what's, what's your top tip? I think the, the three responses so far are really 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 good ones um which makes it challenging i think going last <laughs> um, the uh i think better understanding the kind of flow of 
data and information through a uh, through projects um, would be something that I think could be could be encouraged at university and developed at university a little bit a little bit more. Um, and a kind of great starting point for that, or a great starting point for me for that was looking kind of generative design and um, and because that was something that as an architect and a designer um, you have kind of great control over um, and understanding how you can pass information and data through the design process which is can be controlled by architects and um, then actually starts to inform okay how can we kind of hand that over to another stage and understand the, the broader kind of data flowing in um, in procuring a building so it, it's a good place to test and explore that and I think the benefit for students coming out of the university is that they can directly apply that to um, you know to, uh, traditional architectural roles such as a part two within a practice um, you're using those skills to um, ultimately to design buildings you're using new tools but at the same time um, you're beginning to understand how kind of data can be passed through the process and 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 I think um, when Sue is talking about kind of the, the adoption of BIM, um, that's absolutely vital in that. Um, so, yeah, I, I would I would encourage that. Thank you so much. It's been such an interesting discussion. I've really enjoyed it. I want to say thank you for being a fabulous panel, Rob, Sue, Jack, Brett. Thank you. Thank you to Dell Tech. Thank you to you, our audience. I hope you've enjoyed it. This webinar will be available online um, going forward. So please do check in on that and you can, you can watch it again if you'd like. Um, thank you so much and have a great rest of your day.